What is a black hole? A black hole. I don't know. A, a, a vacuum in space. It's a sp something in space. A phenomenon in space where uh, something sucks all the energy and matter into a new dimension. <laughs> what is heliophysics? Heliophysics is... The study of helium. The way a balloon expands and affects the lungs to create a high-pitched voice uh, when when inhales the helium. Study of the sun and the orbits related to it. How long would it take a rocket to get to Mars? A very long time. I'm gonna say a week. And name a famous scientist. Um, Albert Einstein. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil Tyson deGrasse. Uh, Albert Einstein. Dr. Lika Kuhatakurta, I think I got it right. She's with us today. A NASA scientist has been working with NASA for a long, long time. Um, very unusual that we get to have a heliophysicist with us on the program. I bet you don't even know what that is. We're going to find out. First of all, uh, Dr. can I call you Dr. Lika? Absolutely, and you can drop the doctor, call me Lika. Thank you. That's very kind. So, Lika, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so, I called you a NASA scientist, but I'm kind of selling you short a little bit. Can you sort of give us a brief, you know, one-minute thing on who you are? Well, I mean... Calling me NASA scientist isn't um, unfair. I've worked for NASA since 1993. It's a very big chunk of my life, probably half my life. Um, outside of that, I'm an astrophysicist by training. I'm also a mother, um, a wife, you know, an aunt, all of that, right? Sure. We, we, we define ourselves in so many different ways, personal, professional, Professionally, I'm a scientist and have worked for NASA and still continue to do so. Right on. It kind of sounds like I imagine your little Twitter description is, you know, astrophysicist, mother, aunt, what, you know, whatever, right? Um, I don't even remember that. But ah. yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> okay. Well, we're really thrilled to have you. Now, you're from India originally, um, from Bengal, if I remember correctly. Correct. Um, I want to talk about your journey to the United States. I want to talk about some of your astrophysics work, and I want to talk to you about women in STEM today. Um, but I wonder if you could start with sort of what are you working on now? What brings you to India, and when, what are you doing? So there are a couple of reasons why I'm in India. One is very much sort of professional and building collaboration between US and India, you know, both from a NASA perspective NASA and Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, ISRO is actually going to be launching a solar observatory called Aditya L1. Hmm. Aditya actually in Sanskrit means the sun. And so we, have, we are developing a memorandum of understanding you know, to work together between the scientists at NASA as well as ISRO, but global academic institutions in both countries. The second thing is, and, and so really further sort of collaboration between NASA heliophysics and ISRO in terms of future mission concepts, mm -hmm. all of that. The second uh, point is uh, what I'm currently working on is really artificial intelligence as a tool for really sort of pulling out information from the vast amount of data that NASA has collected uh, over the past, whatever, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. We, we get something like 15 gigabytes of data every second from over 100 plus operating missions, and that's only increasing. I don't think that it is humanly possible to actually really uh, utilize all that data. And so artificial intelligence is coming to aid really to pull discovery class science as well as predictive science for the benefit of humankind. Yeah, but how does an astrophysicist get into artificial intelligence? Those seem sort of 
I won't say they're mutually exclusive, but they don't seem like a natural path to me. It's not mutually exclusive, but almost, you know, I mean, I, I fell into it, I have to say. My who son falls, used who to falls into artificial <laughs> intelligence? Okay, go ahead. Hey, okay, so what's artificial about artificial intelligence? Nothing, right? Artificial intelligence is something we should be calling augmented intelligence. Hmm. People get afraid of the word artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is nothing but math statistics, tensor analysis, things we learn when we, you know, study astrophysics. And so I went to NASA Ames Research Center in California back in 2016 and spent some time there, almost like sabbatical from my NASA headquarters duty. That's where I fell into it. You know, wow. there were people who were working on it and it, it created, there was this concept emerging public-private partnership. So academic institutions, along with leaders in commercial space, commercial AI, like Google, Intel, IBM, and, and we created this program called Frontier Development Lab, bringing early career people, early career domain experts in science and experts in computer science for eight weeks in summer. And we started seeing phenomenal results. And so I, I became a proselytizer after that. So, but math sounds like the underlying piece oh, here, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Um, because I got to tell you, this is a true story. I took astronomy in college. It was a freshman. I was looking for a science class. I didn't like, I shouldn't say, I didn't feel like I was good at science. And I thought astronomy was going to be like, there's Orion and, you know, there's the little dipper. And it was, it was like going to, it was a math class. And so that really opened my eyes to the fact that, um, that physics and astronomy and astrophysics and stuff is really is just math, isn't it? Absolutely. That, that's the truest language we have, math. That's the basis. And then we layer it up. Then comes physics, chemistry, biology, you know, and all the other social sciences that depend on statistics. And now, of course, AI. So are you sitting there as a little girl then way back when, like looking up at the stars, dreaming of being a, an astrophysicist or sort of how, how does well, that? I mean, whoever even knew the word astrophysics Well, right, exactly. Uh, you know, as far as I can remember is uh, I, my, I was very fond of my grandmother and she passed away when I was very young, six or so. And I remember someone in the family telling me that my grandmother had become a star in the sky. I mean, it's such a concept. Oh. I used to look for her. I, I think that's kind of how it began. And I love actually uh, looking at the night sky, looking at sunset, any, any kind of heavenly phenomenon. That is the beginning. That's like the cutest thing I've ever heard. I mean, that, you're, that your grandma's up there as a star and that sort of inspired you to, to start your journey. Um, but you've still got to tackle a number of things along the way. Um, did you sort of set your mind to, to I'm going to go into math and science and, and really do this? Or sort of was that, did, did it just kind of happen? What, what brought you from that, you're staring up at the stars looking at maybe my grandmother's up there to now I'm going to go to the University of New Delhi to get my master's in, in physics? You yeah, know, it's, it's a journey like any other. So that just opened myself to curiosity, basically, right? And I had these profound questions, even at the young age, which most, most children do, actually. And those are questions of big agencies, too. You know, I'd ask my father, you know, what happens to us when we die? Where did we come from? I mean, these are basic human questions. My father was uh, very interesting. He, you know, he was, uh, he's no longer a uh, philosopher and um, a poet, a banker, a mathematician. He mm -hmm. did not kind of, you know, shut me out by not giving me an answer, right? So he would ask me, said, draw a circle, draw a circle. Then he would ask, well, can you tell me where the beginning or end of the circle is? Well, clearly I'm stumped, right? So he was teaching me logic without telling me what he's teaching me, hmm. but he didn't stop me. And that pursuit of curiosity, you know, we were into, so family plays a very big role, you know, solving puzzles, uh, riddles, uh, you know, reading about dinosaurs and going to planetariums. That kind of really inspired me to the world around me. So when did you know science was it? 
right? Any area? I think it's around that time. Okay. I mean, everything about it, you know, it could have been geography, it could have been biology, yeah. it could have been anything, but it's kind of that thirst for wanting to know more about ourselves, about our environment, about, you know, in a way even spirituality, you know, I mean, they, they're not philosophy. These are all connected. So if you think of the questions I was asking then, I haven't stopped asking those questions. I just know how difficult they are to answer. Yeah, and I like this because I think you hear this a lot from people who have had some success in their lives, that being curious, right, and always asking questions um, has keeps people motivated. Um, at some point, though, you make the move from University of New Delhi to the University of Denver, I believe, and also Colorado. Uh, yes, at, Boulder, Colorado. At, by Boulder, um, beautiful part of the country. Um, what made you decide to go to study in the United States? Well, that, that's something pretty much everyone did. Although, you know, my journey is somewhat circuitous. I was planning to finish my PhD in the country and then go to um, U.S., but I decided to leave early. Timing seemed, seemed right. I'd finished my MPhil, which is a prerequisite for um, going, uh, you know, doing PhD in US. Many of my other friends, you know, from my batch and other batches had already gone to US. But the only place where I had a girlfriend was in University of Denver. Oh. I didn't even know Denver existed, frankly, or Colorado was a state because we are not taught geography you know, in India. If you are doing high school in science, then you are just limited to just science and some language mm. and nothing about history, geography that becomes past. So, you know, it wasn't a strong point. But because I had a girlfriend in uh, Denver who was living with her um, uncle, I chose University of Denver. Boy, isn't that funny how our destinies end up being oh, absolutely put on these paths by these sort of ra you know seemingly random connections? I think about that all the time. Um, okay, so you end up in Denver. We call it the Mile High City in the United States. It's at five thousand something feet. Yes. Um, in Colorado, in the mountains, in the middle of the country. Um, tell me about your experience living in Denver. Ah, uh, that was uh, amazing. As a child growing up in India, you know, I was called a sickly child. I would, um, you know, about one third of the year, I wouldn't be attending school. I would have common cold. That's what it was called. Little did I know that was all allergy. Huh. So I go to Denver and it's one of the drier places in the U.S. Everything disappeared. Wow. And I recognized that how much I love the mountains. You know, these are things you don't know till you have experienced it. Uh, so the bond with Colorado was almost instantaneous. I had a girlfriend. I made many other friends. Actually, I met my um, future husband, who is American, hmm. from Kansas City, Kansas. Hmm. Who would ever imagine all these things would happen, yes. right? And um, so, you know, what? I mean, going to school was easy. I had already done so much coursework. So in that sense, I was advanced from most of the students, but you have to go through some of that. Uh, what was very interesting is the research component. So I landed up doing my research at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And so the thrust, you know, in India, when I did research, it was very theoretical in nature. Uh, in the U.S., there was a lot of data, so you kind of assimilated data with modeling hmm. and theoretical interpretation. But how do you, I have spent zero time in academia, I don't know anything about re anything, um, but I always see, you know, Professor so-and-so is an expert in, you know, tire compounds on, you know, cars that go over 100 miles an hour, something like all these very, like, very specific things. And it's hard for me to imagine, like, I don't know how in the world I would pick something and especially to drill down like that. So when you're a grad student, like how do you, how do you migrate towards an, an area of research that you're interested in? So I was already kind of focused on an area, okay. which actually changed. Huh. So when I was in the University of Denver, um, I studied astrophysics and general theory of relativity, okay. which is cosmology. Okay. Back in the days, this is we are talking of, I came to uh, U.S. in 1980. So, so like, think of what cosmology was then. And like what Carl cosmology. Sagan. Absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. So that was my focus, particle physics, cosmology. You know, I was trying to get to the heart of what 
astrophysics, cosmology is. It, it's, as I said, you know, spirituality, philosophy, and science, basically. So when I came to Denver, uh, you know, there were a couple of astrophysics professors who went on sabbatical, never returned. So I kind of landed up doing my research in atmospheric physics, which was actually looking at the ozone hole by taking some data from the sun, carbon monoxide data. I won't kind of make it complicated. So that was kind of starting to look at the sun. I had also done research on sun while I was at uh, University of Delhi. So, but I would have left University of Denver and gone to another university to do particle physics and cosmology because, hmm. you know, I could not satisfy that urge I had. But by then, I had met my future husband-to-be, and I changed my, uh, you know, path again. So I stayed on, okay. and I pursued solar physics by kind of going to National Center for Atmospheric Research, where they had a group actually doing um, solar physics research at High Altitude Observatory. So this brings us to heliophysics, which is your... That's the beginning. Can you settle the score for us here? What is heliophysics? Oh, helio means sun. Okay. Okay, that, that they got right. But heliophysics is not just about the sun only. So first of all, I want to say heliophysics is a completely made up word. And so we can get to define what heliophysics is. Heliophysics is a brand new discipline. Now people know astrophysics, people know earth science. So I want to draw some parallels so people kind of understand. So if you think of meteorology, that's earth science. And meteorology has no connection to earth science, right? Right, because I know, think about like earthquakes and stuff with earth science. And meteorology, you think about it's going to rain. Okay, fine. So heliophysics is kind of like that. Heliophysics actually studies the sun and its interaction with our planet. This is the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, many layers of our um, you know, atmosphere. So it's the interaction of the sun with these layers but it also studies the interaction of the sun with all other planets, with the interplanetary medium, which is sort of the void between the sun and all the planets, including the interstellar medium, you know, which is sort of the end of the solar system, right? Sun's influence. But is it our, so the sun is a star. Sun is a star. So when you study the sun, are you studying all stars, or is it our specific? Is there, is there our specific? Our specific sun? star. Okay. And that that's really special because you know we cannot study any other star with the kind of details we are studying it. Right. We have a spacecraft that that was like my last mission with my program, living with the star, uh, which is actually going to the star. We say to touch the star, Parker Solar Probe. And, right. and that, that, that's just absolutely mind-boggling. And that is going to go within 10 solar radii of the sun, okay? So you can go up close and personal with our star and study it in great detail. And if you understand our star, by proxy, you get to understand many other stars. Mm. If you understand the relationship between our sun and our planet, then by proxy, you can understand another sun, okay, another star in another, um, uh, you know, galaxy, and what we call exoplanets, you know, where we are looking for habitable exoplanets. So you need this knowledge. Heliophysics actually provides this knowledge of the sun-earth connection, sun-planet connection, that can be exported to any world. So talk to, talk to us a little bit about living with the star and what that was, and or is, I suppose, um, and yeah. Uh, living with the star, you know, just the name itself, isn't that just beautiful? Yes. I mean, for, a, for any program. And so in, back in 2000, 2001, you know, Congress essentially funded this uh, program in space science, which was very unique still is unique. And this was really to kind of study the sun-earth system science and look at that science which is relevant to life and society. Normally, when we look at cosmology, when we look at the galaxies, when we uh, send, you know, the latest James Webb Space Telescope, it's very much 
curiosity driven science, mm -hmm. right? Living with the Star Wars uh, program, which was sort of the intersection between curiosity driven science, but that curiosity driven science that is also relevant to life and society. Okay. And so that was the beginning. And so this was the point where I left basically my personal research. You know, I can hardly call myself a scientist anymore in that sense because I don't do my own research. But I enabled research basically through this program with multiple missions that collect data with a research program called Targeted Research and Technology, which would focus on kind of this connected system science questions. Um, you know, creating uh, the textbooks for heliophysics because hmm. we didn't have textbooks. Yeah. And how can you have a new discipline without textbooks? So, you know, it's, it's the program kind of established sort of the foundation for heliophysics. So what, what have you learned about the sun? Well, I, well, I, I feel like an idiot for asking this, but what's, in, what's interesting about the sun? Like what's, uh, what's something new? I don't know. Tell me about the sun. Everything, actually, what we are, this is what I can tell you, sure. okay? Um, I, I think sun is new every day. Hmm. That's what I say on my Twitter, I think. Um, every day, people don't recognize that because we look at the sun in visible wavelength and it just seems that sort of dull yellow, if the sky is hazy, it's yellower, but it's very constant, you can't see anything. But if you see the sun with like x-rays, okay, or some other wavelength, it is dynamic and bubbling and seething. Hmm. That's very interesting that people don't know, don't get to see, but you know, our telescopes kind of show that, which is just unique. But with Parker Solar Probe, you know, it has gone so far into the sun. This is the first spacecraft that has reached the distance it has reached. How does it uh, not melt? Uh, very carefully. We go at night. <laughs> Good. This is the, you know, there, there are all kinds of jokes <laughs> for this, okay? But um, I, I, I think this mission concept sort of was there in the back of scientists' mind for a long time, but the technology had to mature and we needed to have enough resources to actually carry it out. So we have actually cooling devices. You know, it's a cone-shaped uh, huh. sort of umbrella almost where the instruments are in the shade. Okay. There's only one instrument that actually pokes out a little huh. bit just to sample the local environment. That's what we are trying to do. We are trying to, this is like ground truth, yeah. okay? Because we always see every heavenly object with remote sensing observations, with telescopes, with wavelengths, and then we invert that data and kind of get information about temperature and density and all that. This particular spacecraft is actually sampling the local environment. Wow. Can so, you imagine? So, I mean, that, that, yeah, it, it still gives me goosebumps. And what do you expect to find? So what we are finding, well, we have models, right? Yeah. So the, the, the basic question for over 50 years, it's, a, it's a, one of the fundamental questions of physics, not just astrophysics, is that, you know, the solar surface is at a temperature of five to 6,000 degrees Celsius, okay? But the corona, which is outside of that, is at a temperature of million degrees. How does that happen? So it's cooler on the inside and it's hotter on the outside. It's cooler on that yellow disk you see. Yeah. And when you come to the outer atmosphere, it's hotter. So huh. think of it this way. You're in front of a gas stove, okay? The further and then the source is the fire, right? The further you move away from that, the temperature is going to get cooler. Right. That's kind of normal, right? In this case, the further away we are moving from the sun, and the core of the sun is, of course, thermonuclear fusion that's generating energy. So you're moving further away, and the temperature is increased hugely. Interesting. What makes the corona so hot? Yeah, yeah why? The, what, is there something happening within the corona itself? So, a so lot, lot of interactions going on, mm. you know, wave particle interactions, lot of this convection motion dumping energy into the corona. So 
you know, there are many theories, many ideas, but how do you verify what's going on? So you have to go there and locally measure the environment. It's like putting a thermometer, right? And yeah. measuring the temperature or measuring the pressure. So that's what we're doing. Okay. Locally, you're measuring how many electrons, what's the temperature of the electrons, what's the magnetic field environment. And now we, with that, we will be able to constrain all the models. But more importantly, you're asking what's new. So the data that we are seeing, it is so novel, so new. I pour, and, and we have not, of course, you know, analyzed all this data. We are taking this data as we speak. I believe that uh, our idea of how the corona is heated is going to need lead to new new signs. Huh. And maybe we could read. Well, anyways, I don't want to extrapolate. I'm sitting here nodding like I have any idea, um, which I don't. Um, but it sounds really interesting it, to me. It is absolutely amazing. Um, th this is something a friend of mine asked, and I promised I'd ask it. How how long will the sun be with us? Oh God, I should know that answer, right? Something like I mean, don't quote me on this. Four, five billion years, you know, I mean. But it does burn I, out eventually. Oh, yes. Like everything else, you know, everything. There's a cycle for all of this. And sun is a medium-sized star. It's going to go through a phase called red giant, where it's kind of going to use up all the hydrogen, helium, et cetera, and then start expanding. And uh, that expansion is going to essentially uh, overtake our planet, other planets. You know, it's going to become a larger sphere, the red giant sphere. Eventually, it's going to shed all of that and become what's called a white dwarf, you know, a small, very dense kind of uh, entity in, in the sky. That, that's kind of the end of life for our um, star. So we know that, though, because we, that. we, as we look out in the universe, because everything's so far away and light, tra we can only th see things with light. That's the fastest thing that we have. What we're looking at is a time capsule, right? And so we can say this is sort of, we know that a, a, a million years ago, this planet was probably alive, but now we're seeing it dead or, or whatever it is. Um, but knowing that, and, and I hate to get into the alien question because it, it's an interesting discussion without getting into little green people. Um, what's your sense on habitable life in, in the universe? There's so many ways to answer that question. Um, habitable life in what form? What is life, right? Yeah. So I, I do not doubt for a second that um, you know, cellular structure life has to be ubiquitous in the universe. But if you're talking about intelligent life, that's a different question. And what fraction of these gazillions of stars we have in the star exoplanet system kind of could have given rise to this intelligent habitable world? All I want to say is that I want to believe that this is happening, this is possible, because it doesn't make sense any other way if we are the only creation in universe that is so special. But, and even if my math is right, if there is existing life right now as we speak on another planet, it, we won't know for another million years or something, oh, right? Because of the, the, this, this we can only see with light. That, that's, that's right. But again, remember, you know, how we are still learning new physics. Mm. We cannot shut our mind to, you know, I mean, think about it. Did, did we imagine, you know, we'd be doing this podcasting that everyone else can see or we'll carry, um, you know, an iPhone and talk to people all around? Mm. I mean, 100 years ago, people would have thought that is magic, that is impossible. So, we are not done kind of figuring out physics. There is still more to be learned. And right now, with our knowledge, we cannot see what could lead to that. But let's not close our mind to that. I like let's it. keep pursuing. Magic is science we can't explain. 
Um, but, but anyways, I don't want to get way off into the uh, philosophical astrophysical discussion too much uh, because I did want to talk to you about something that um, is more immediate and important, and that is uh, women in STEM. You're obviously an immensely successful woman in, in a STEM field. You're at NASA. Like, that's really cool. Um, but if you look at the numbers, women are still um, underrepresented across the STEM fields. I think like 30 percent to 70 percent sort of writ large. Um, do you see us making progress on that? Actually, it is the opposite. It's a bit alarming in that that progress is going down, I think. Oh, you're so I can, I can give you an example. Yeah. When I did master's in University of Delhi, we had 100 students um, in my class, 50 men, 50 women. Hmm. We, we had like a clique of five Bengali women. We all became something, you know. So we never felt we were women doing science. That, that, that was not a realization I had till I came to USA. And I told people that, you know, I come from a third world country, a word coined by Jawaharlal Nehru, I come to a first world country to feel that sense of being a woman scientist, which I had never felt before. Huh. That is kind of changing even in India today. And, um, I personally don't understand why, but it is really sort of family values, cultural values that lead to societal values. That's what we need to look at to, to empower, uh, you know, all people. I mean, I, I really work with all young people and I say not because you are a woman, but that is becoming important because I find fewer people going into hard sciences, but this is true also of men. You know, I, I don't know who's inspiring. Who, If there's a young girl right now staring at the stars, like you did, right, and maybe, you know, and their grandma's up in the stars, who's their role model? Who do they follow? So I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is mentioned because he has popularized science, mm. you know? So I wouldn't look at him as, um, I, I, in terms of gender. He's done an amazing job of uh, bringing science to people who are not technically trained. So it's amazing if people are paying attention because they're listening to what he has to say. So I can take him out. Okay. Um, Einstein, of course, is Einstein, right? Um, from the point of view of women, there are just so many, so many. So I think what we have to do is bring role models and put extra emphasis that we haven't. And how, and, how and, do I find a role model though? So again, if I'm the young girl, I'm high school, college, whatever, and I'm interested in this, I, where do I go to find that person and say, hey, can I, I don't know, do an informational interview or, or something? Like, where, where do I go? There, there's a lot of material anymore because people are very cognizant. I can mm. tell you that what NASA is doing. I mean, sure. we are absolutely kind of promoting this at a, uh, you know, for a long time. Outreach has been a goal. Uh, women are, because there are so many talented uh, women uh, being featured. But that's kind of what we have to do. We have to, I think teachers have to get this information. They exist and and pass it on to their students. So it, it it's just families have to do that. I mean, how did I become what I became? You know, nobody in my family is a scientist. Mm. I, I could argue with my father. I could discuss. He wanted me to do fine arts with math. I said, no, I want to do science. And if I don't do science, I will never be able to pursue science. Mm. And he listened objectively and allowed me to do that. So families, societies, teachers, we all have to play our government, have to play our role. Now, but do you feel like you faced any discrimination coming up in, 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 the, in the science world? I did not. Yeah. I did not. I mean, isn't that amazing? Yeah, I, I, and again, I'm of a couple of minds here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, I gotta be careful how I say this. It seems to me that in STEM, in the hard science, you are your work, right? And the work is, by its very nature, black and white. And I suspect that if you can, br if you can bring the goods, no one cares, right? 
Um, but I don't know about the politics within academia and who's the chair and, who, and that sort of thing. There, there is a lot of that, I have to say that. So one of the things, you know, I would tell people is that stop thinking about those things. Hmm. Really, because the more time you spend, the more engaged you get, the more negative your thoughts become. Just pursue your goals. Pursue your family. You know, create. We have the ability to create our environment. That's what I believe in. I mean, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a strength we don't emphasize. We kind of try to um, sort of, you know, sometimes... Um, reduce our ability by what people think of us. And I think we have to get out of that mindset. I mean, India is full of philosophers, leaders, people like Swami Vivekananda, who inspired me immensely hmm. as a child. You know, I used to do elocution. I mean, just unbelievable wisdom and words. And he would say, you know, all power is within us. It really is true. I mean, you have to kind of internalize that. And you have to have a family structure, a societal structure that won't put you down, right? Allow you to grow. Yeah. Uh, all power is within us. I like it. That's probably a nice place for us to wrap up today. If people do want to learn more about you and your work, what's a, what's a good place to find you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. I guess that's the professional place okay. to find me. And, I saw, and, and your, your bio is on uh, NASA's website, too. Yes. So I guess they could track you yes. down there, too. Uh, thanks so much for coming on and joining us. Really fascinating journey, story, uh, and life that you've lived. And uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much.